Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I think it's eight o'clock, so it's about time we uh, kicked off. Thanks everyone for attending this evening. Um, briefly introduce myself, although I will go into a little bit more detail a bit later on, if my voice holds out. Um, my name is Derek Fellows. Uh, I'm chairman at the moment. Um, try and keep this as a very interactive meeting this evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Mark Fisher and the staff at uh, Freer Manor for making these wonderful facilities available to us this evening. Um, I'm sure Mark would like to talk to anyone if they want a special party or a wedding venue. A little plug there. Is there any press here this evening, by the way? No press? Okay. All right. I'd like to thank all the uh, political representatives here tonight. Uh, we've got a very good uh, coverage from all of the parties. As I always say at these meetings as an introduction, this action group is a non-political group. We work with anyone and everyone to achieve our aims. And I'll ask you later, a bit later on, what your expectations and aims are, so you can feed it direct to our politicians. Thank you all for attending. I'm sorry, this is the <clears throat> I am struggling, as you can probably detect. I'm recovering from man flu, and all the, all the gents in the audience will uh, understand how debilitating that is. The women don't uh, understand that, but uh, you know. Um, this is the third public meeting. Um, they've all been very well attended, and we have a fourth one coming up, which I will uh, mention a bit later on. Uh, expected duration is two hours, thereabouts. Um, we can never tell exactly how long they're going to take. Depends how much uh, feedback that we, we get from the floor. Um, okay, let's just yeah, now way. As I said, my name is Derek Fellows. I'm a local resident in Langdon Hills. Um, moved here about 25, 26 years ago, where my wife, a girl from Essex, no, I did put that the right way around. Um, she brought me out here from uh, Middlesex, Northwest London area. We have two children, they've grown up in this area, they attend the local schools, and we love this community. I've been involved in various campaigns down the years, but I have to say, I've never known one that quite like this one where it has been taken up by the wide community. The take up has been quite amazing. And I'm going back to the days when I was a founder member of the Residents Association. Uh, we campaigned against the Tesco hypermarket. And you may think we weren't successful because we do have a, uh, a supermarket. Well, we, we forced the community forced that one to a public in inquiry. And as I say, a positive was we didn't get a hypermarket, we got a supermarket. Much less impact on the community. Because once again, Bazan Council rolled over in those days. They decided they could uh, do away with a number of uh, uh, space for housing to put up a, a hypermarket. The bribe then was that uh, Tesco offered to pay for the local community shops, doctor surgery and uh, community centre. So we lost housing then. It's strange that we're now looking around for additional housing space. Um, briefly, other campaigns I've been involved in, uh, looking for, fighting for a local area secondary school, many of you um, may remember that. And uh, I was also a founder of a local football team for boys and girls. Um, so I've been involved in lots of community cam campaigns. <clears throat> I won't go on about me, this isn't about me. I'd like to uh, introduce our press officer, Philip Gibbs, who's worked diligently, and I have to thank him for all the work he's done this week. You know, he always works hard, he's done an awful lot more this week while I've been laid up. Philip. Um, so I'm, I'm Philip Gibbs, as, as uh, Derek said. I don't have the same experience of campaigning he does. This is my first time, but I've lived in uh, the area around Langdon Hills for um, I think about 15 years now and uh, uh, I live with my wife and, and two children and uh, we, we learned about this development just a few weeks ago 
and uh, we, we thought it would be good to, to do some things and say some things about it. Um, so I'm going to be giving a presentation which is all video recorded. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, you, you get to see it today. If you've seen it before, then you get a second chance. Um, and uh, then we're going to have lots of good, good speakers, so I'm looking forward to this myself. I'll pass it back now. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. The third member of our committee, an important one again, is Treasurer, uh, Zoe Chambers. Um, Zoe is looking after all the money, your money that we get from contributions. Okay, um, what do, how do we get formed and what have we achieved so far? Well, I'm a nosy kind of guy and I heard about this uh, study about two and a half, three weeks ago and I went to one of the first drop-ins uh, the church just off the A128. And I met a very pleasant young lady from a planning officer from Brentwood and a planning officer from, from Basildon. Um, they were there, they were doing a, a job, couldn't have a go with them, it would have been wrong. They answered some of the questions. It's all very high level, no detail. Basically, all they could tell us was four to six thousand homes. Um, it's for they said West Basildon, but as the night rolls on, you will realise that's only the tip of the iceberg. We're reaching out into other communities and making them aware, and this has got a major implication. It's not just, as it's posed, West Basildon. When I went back home, I said to my wife, this is dynamite. You know, why is the council not uh, broadcasting this? I said, you know, the only thing that we could think of was using Facebook. You know, I have a Facebook account, don't use it, I think I've probably got about four contacts. My wife typically has a whole lot more. And we announced it, or Debbie announced it on Facebook, and it took off like a rocket. Um, Facebook's good for getting the message across, it's not very good for tracking, it never was meant for that. But it was a tool that we had to use. And we started that Facebook group on Saturday the 17th of January. And when I checked today, it had 1,606 members as of 10 o'clock today. And it's growing and growing as we reach out into other communities. We advise people that they need to object to this and object strongly. And there's um, various ways that you can do that. <clears throat> I don't think my voice is gonna last and perhaps I'll ask Philip to give some advice on the best way. We do have a box of pamphlets here which will uh, assist when you go home tonight. So I checked today, there are about 800 comments or objections to this uh, project being raised on the Basilan Council website. You can also write in, you can also email in, so we don't have an accurate uh, number. Um, don't know how many people have used the alternative methods. One thing I did, uh, I kind of like using rumour. Um, so I, I go to people that have the facts. And I went to Basel and Council officers and I said, what is the voting situation? And it's not a vote per household. If you've got mum and dad, that's two votes. So I said, well, what about children? And they went away, they come back, yes, children can vote. Well, that's okay, my children are 24 or almost, and 25 almost. I asked, but what about a 10 year old? And again, it threw them into confusion. And they come back and said, oh yes, they can vote. So if you're the, quote, average family, unquote, mom, dad, and two children, there's four votes there, or four objections. The only thing that appears is every member has to have a unique email address. Because if you go in through the Basel website uh, uh, portal, you have to register, it emails you back for confirmation, and then you then raise your objection. <clears throat> you can also, if you think, oh heck Gil, yeah, I forgot these three valid points I want to raise as objections, you can go back in and you can add an add. As I said, you can also email in and you can write in. So it's not a one shot and that's it. I, I, I do advise people to raise uh, objections 
If you're a member of our Facebook group, and please do, if you're not a member, please join. If you could remember, when you raise an objection, you will get a number back. And if you just post that, so we get some rough idea of, of how many have been raised. When we've done well, we've produced many template documents, and Fib has been really hard at work at that. Uh, pamphlets that you can pull down, print, um, an example letter of what you may wish to use to raise uh, an objection in uh, writing. I'm really amazed at the amount of research that the community has done and how we're finding out all the other communities that are faced with similar problems. And we do have a few speakers here tonight that are asked to give us a brief up update. <clears throat> Philip, as he said, he's created a brilliant uh, audio-visual here in his life, and we will um, look at that and listen to that in a minute. And I think it encapsulates all the problems that I know that you're going to raise. And I will come to you very shortly and pass the mic around the floor, and I'll ask you to be thinking now of a one-liner or one sentence of what your fears are, what you expect to happen. <clears throat> and this will be fed straight into our politicians um, and they hopefully will take that on board and act on it. We've had uh, several photo shoots, we are getting known to the press and we are getting the um, publicity which also helps to spread the word because it's still amazing how many people just haven't heard of this project. I actually phoned Basel and Council planning and I uh, said to a lady there why are you keeping this under the wire? It's pretty sneaky. And she said to me, Mr. Fellow, she said, we find that uh, doing letter drops through every letterbox isn't very effective. And as God is my witness, I kid you not, why we had that conversation, a representative from Basel and Council dropped a letter through my letterbox. And it was confirmation of who is eligible to vote at the upcoming elections. So on one hand, it's very effective. But to communi communicate this message to everybody, I'll leave you to make your own impressions there. Um, we have engaged with uh, Basel and Council planning officers. Some there are very knowledgeable and you know, very helpful. They would rather have people go to them uh, from this group so we can you know, nail any um, rumours and misconceptions. We've also engaged with Essex Wildlife Trust, who are looking at this project with uh, regarding the impact on wildlife because we are talking about a very, very special piece of land and uh, we'll try to describe exactly where that land is. We've started to reach out to our action groups, as I said, and uh, we, will, <coughs> we will have people talking from them this evening. We uh, met with the committee from the Dunton Village. I keep calling them Dunton Village people, but that's probably because I can remember back to the 60s. Um, sorry about that, Dunton Village. So yes, we're having a kind of joint approach with them. And there is a representative from their group who we will work with. We want to come up with um, some meaningful posters, car stickers, with an image that we can just share around the community. Unfortunately, it's looking as though it's been quite expensive, so not sure where we're going with that one. We also reached out to the Bitteriki group and uh, they were faced with a similar problem over a year ago and we've got Mike from the Bitteriki group who will talk, uh, give us a, some advice on where they stand. I just want to repeat, this is not just a local issue. I mean, you know, let's face it, four to six thousand new homes, say two cars per household, that's twelve thousand cars. Has anyone driven on the A127 lately? Has anyone tried to take their children to school over in Brentwood or Shenfield lately? You can imagine all those many people. <clears throat> uh, just a brief uh, minute, uh, notice about an upcoming meeting. We have booked James Hornsby School for the 12th of March. Now that is dangerously close to the cutoff date to raise your objections. Um, unfortunately, with people being unavailable and the school having other bookings, um, we were forced on that date. We will go into other communities so that we can spread the word. And I would ask all of you 
by word of mouth or whatever, to spread the word as far as you can, because as I said, there are so many communities that don't know of this. And the impact is, <clears throat> you know, it's very, very high. <clears throat> In our previous two meetings, we've had good representation from our uh, local politicians and good advice and feedback, and please to say, and tonight we're looking for the very same. I'm amazed at just how this community has taken this project on, as I said before. You know, people are printing thousands of leaflets at their own cost. They're distributing those leaflets. On the other weekend, when we had the Sunday photo shoot, I met a lady who said that she'd been out for seven hours with a friend, leafleting and knocking on doors. So it, it really is, it's uh, quite amazing. As I said, uh, Facebook's not the best tool in the world for tracking you know, what people say, and we may have missed some roads and we may have duplicated, but unfortunately Facebook is the tool we have to work with. Um, we now have known across the web system. Philip, um, he's created a blog and a web page. And Philip, I think your website is number one in the Google ranking? Sometimes number one and sometimes number two. I think. There you go, number one and number two in Google rankings. So we hope that website is being hit, the message is getting across, but I will keep coming back to it. You know, please spread the word. I mean, through Facebook and uh, my wife's friends and my friend, we're known in Alabama, in Gold Coast of Australia, in Tokyo, but regrettably those people can't help. Um, so that spreading the word is the message, please. Okay, that's enough from me at the moment. What I'm gonna do, I did say I'd come amongst the organs and ask you to raise a one-liner, a one-sentence, what you expect, what you want to see, you know, what we can tell our politicians. So I'm just going to walk amongst you. If you're desperate to get your point over, raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, I'll put the mic in front of you anyway. Because when you take a look at what's happened here, you know, everything, just to go back a few years, everything from Berry Lane all the way back to Tesco's is all, I mean, practically all developed for housing. And Tesco has got what they got. And it's a perfectly good industrial estate, 500 yards up the road. Didn't build it there. So all those housing blocks all came up. What's happening to Dry Street? It's still going on. They're going to build, Christ knows how many houses on Dry Street. There's the Dunton, the London High Road School, that was developed. Go to Dunton to the research centre. There's a bloody new road going through there with God knows how many houses. There's two 500 acre fields over at Wickford being developed for housing. And they're talking about they're going to improve the infrastructure. They'll make the place look like London. And that's what we come down here to avoid. So I don't think they can be trusted. And I think we have a vote and no confidence in Bagenham Council because they look upon Greenbelt as a commodity for profit. And that's what they've been doing. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jane and I live in Herringate and we were totally unaware of this um, till what, a week ago. So we really support it because we are going to be inundated around our village. We've got plans down to Hutton, round the back, so we're going to be totally surrounded by houses. We really need you to support us as well. Uh, name's Ken. I've lived in the Lane, the Lane of the area all my life. Um, there's just a couple of things. I'm not going to go over all the problems with the infrastructure at this moment, because like, we all know about all the different problems that, that, that we think it will create. But, um, there's one thing when you talk to the councillors, they always turn around and say, it's for the benefit of Basel, for the Basildon people. 6,000 houses, whenever you pin one and get them to one side, they will turn around and they will agree 75% of those people will come from outside the Basildon area. First point. Second point, quickly, I did a few statistics, and I noticed some statistics, and that was running through. The population census in 2011 for Basildon was about 175,000 for the Basel Borough. That was top of the list, it was number one. The next area was South End at about 174,000. If you then split that into the square mileage, right, is what they work on, the density of Basildon came fourth. South End was the highest with a figure of 10,000. Basildon, um, hold on, uh, number two, in fact, was Harlow, let's forget that for a minute. Number three was Castle Point with over 5,000, uh, 5, yeah. 
and Basland came in at 4,000. Now just think about it. South End, Castle Point, Basildon. There's two roads yeah. coming out, the A127 and the A13, and no stretch of the imagination can they ever turn those into a motorway. So you've got all those, you've got Brent. Brentwood, funny enough, is one of the lowest densities, about 1,200, and in, in, in a square mileage which is quite some, somewhat greater than ours. If anybody listening to Basildon, uh, BBC Essex, with Mr. our friend Mr. Monk, about a week ago, he was interviewing the deputy, man, the deputy chairman of um, Bas um, Essex County Council. I think Barrister Johnson must have made a comment about moving outside of the, the, uh, the London boundaries, whatever those boundaries are, on the Greenbelt land. And the impression I got from Essex County Council, the deputy, um, um, deputy chairman, was in no way was that really going to happen. So I'm struggle, struggling with set the Basel Council. If you've got the Essex County Council saying they're not going to move into um, into the uh, the Greenbelt area, why have we got the Basel Council slowly working, slowly in the background? To me, that's a, a very worrying point. So I think Basel Council ought to go back and talk to Essex County Council. I don't know if there's any councillors here who are on the Essex uh, County Council. You are. Um, you may well have been aware of that interview. I don't know. But I listened to it. In fact, I actually stopped the car to pick it up um, because he was saying, you know, no way, you know, unless there's a very, very strong reason. And my argument is, yes, there is a housing problem in this country, but why is Basel going to solve it for the whole country? Yeah. <laughs> you said, don't get political. <clears throat> But there's a reason why there's a housing problem in this country, and that's because we have a complete open door. Uh, we allow people to come from all around the world. They get free housing, free schooling, free accommodation. It's all paid for by British taxpayers. Until politicians get their heads around this and do something about it, the situation will not resolve itself. This is just a, a continuation of that problem across the entire country. Um, and I object to this on a number of grounds locally. I've lived here for 20 years. Um, but there's a wider problem behind this that's coming from central government. And that, I'm sorry, is the real problem. Thank you. I was going to raise the subject about schools um, because, I mean, obviously, Derek, 15 years ago, you were heavily involved in trying to get secondary school here anyway. I've been speaking to some of the local schools where we've got three primary schools here, each with a 60 pupil intake per year. They could fill James Hornsby on their own. James Hornsby this year, their 180 intake has got eight spare places. They expect to be full next year, and um, so where are our children that are already here going to go without these houses and um, so at the moment under the proposal there's no um, what's it there's talk about primary schools but there's nothing concrete about secondary schools um, councillor smith there had raised a thing in the video that was on facebook and is it councillor finch used the term the houses have to actually materialize physically before they can profile the population to work out if we need any extra schools. We have the need for them with um, you know, the houses that are here and all of the development that's going up elsewhere increases the chance. 132 pupils from our three local primary schools had to go out of area this year. I don't have school aged children anymore. This doesn't you know, matter to me, you could say, but my children now are old enough to be parents themselves. It's going to matter to them, and if we wait until all the green belts built on, it's too late. I mean, if we're going to widen the 127, that has to be done before any houses can go in. All of these things have to be done before the houses go there, and there doesn't seem to be any provision for any of that. And I'm not sure where they're going to... Um, you know, find the money for widening the 127 as they've never straightened the fortune war. That was too expensive. How are they going to do the rest and build on the green belt in doing so?
just to uh, pick up about Matt's point about uh, primary schools of all those years ago, um, we were told at that time by Essex local education authority officers that the three uh, primary schools, Great Berry, Linswood and Maryland, could not justify a secondary school. Well, I don't take no as an answer. So I did, not using rumour, go to the source. I went to the eight uh, local head teachers and I got a head count of pupils from reception through and including year six. And I proved to the uh, Essex LEA officers that the five local schools to James Hornsby would in fact fill that school. All the way through from, say, if you take the year six going in as a first year, and then you go through the whole uh, seven years of the school. And it proved it. I also proved, taking the same uh, headcount for Great Barry Lins with the Maryland's, that we did need a secondary school in this community. But I won't go into the political machinations, um, but just to pick up on what the lady just said, you know, forget about the new housing developments, you know, there's a secondary school to be justified now. Anybody else too? Good evening, I'm a Langdon Hills resident and I'm quite concerned about the environmental impact. Um, pollution, if we have extra traffic. Also, litter, which is one of my pet hates. Basildon and surrounding councils can't keep the roads and the paths and the undergrowth clean now. What's it going to be like if we have all these extra houses? So that's one of my great concerns. Also, healthcare. I think is um, an awfully big consideration as well because both um, Queen's Hospital and Basildon Hospital and South End, if, it, if we go that far, just cannot possibly cope, I don't think, with the great influx of extra patients. Having worked at, uh, in the local health system myself most of my life, I know a lot of the problems, so you know, I can speak on relative authority about it. I'd like to know as well what's going to happen with all the surface water because we know there's a problem with water draining onto these fields at the moment. If housing's built that's going to be concrete, where's the water going to drain to? We also know that Langdon Hills does have a problem with subsidence, so if there's going to be more building on the area, is that, does that mean there's going to be more subsidence to the current houses that are here? Anybody else? Uh, oh, right. I got to just pick up this gentleman. We'll come back. Just one other thing on top of that with these services. You've got the schools. What about the policing? What about the highways? All of that maintenance, that extra property, extra land, extra roads. That's all got to be done. Who's going to do that? Because the councils are cutting back with staff. Police are cutting back with policing. Where are they going to do? They've got an extra 6,000 properties and roads to police and clean. I was just going to pick up the point of the surface water flooding. Um, most of my family are living in Kent and the same sort of development's been going on down there. And where my sister had lived, I mean, those who've been on the Facebook site will have seen that I posted this, but she was completely outside of flood zone when she moved into her property. And developments went up, she came into the, at some risk, the pale blue area on the Environment Agency. She's now slap bang in the middle of the high risk. There's very few people who will want to insure her property, and that's all because of developments going up in the area. Anybody else before we move on to the next uh, item? Oh, sorry. I came here with a relatively open mind, but bear in mind we've got our MP and representative from the County Council. As I understand it's government policy that's driving the need for this development. So as we've got our local MP and some from the Essex County Council, can they explain why there is a need and why it's being driven by, I assume, government policy? 
we, as he points out, we do have a good representation here this evening, and we do have a section in these public meetings called the uh, politicians drop in. So we will be passing the mic over to the, the men of in a short while. Uh, yes, um, the National Planning Policy document lists five purposes for the protection of green belt. Amongst those purposes, the first one is to prevent urban sprawl. Currently, the urbanisation of Baswood stops at, the, at West Main. If you carry out this building project and extend it to the A128, it will be urban sprawl. It won't be a garden suburb with all nice birdies fly flying around and everyone being happy. It's also designed to pr protect the historic character of uh, villages. Uh, Dunton Village goes back to the Doomsday Book. It was once owned by William the Conqueror's half-brother. It was once owned by uh, King's College Cambridge at one point. It's also designed to protect the open and rural character of the <coughs> villages, uh, which is characteristic of Dunton. There are lots of businesses here that rely on the open character of, of Greenbelt for recreational activities, here weddings and things like that. But uh, four out of the five purposes uh, listed in the National Planning Policy document are contradicted by this uh, project if it is carried out. It's contrary to Greenbelt policy. And uh, I've actually read that document, a friend here made me aware of it, and I've read that, and I totally endorse what he says. There are five major points there, and you know, at least four of those will drive a bus through this uh, uh, proposal. Philip, you and I have never given our views. You've done all the work, do you want to say what you... Uh... Um, yeah, I think... Just, just to add, add what uh, it's Chris, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, what he said about the, the, the government policy on Greenbelt. The, the other important thing that's written into the documents is that the Greenbelt is permanent. It's not something that, you, that we're meant to hang on to until, uh, until we need it for housing. Uh, it's, it's meant to not be built on ever. That's, that's the whole purpose of it. Um, and this is in documents that were written uh, and came into law just a couple of years ago uh, when the Greenbelt policy was really re renewed by the Conservatives. So it's very bizarre that uh, we're now standing here with um, the prospect of 6,000 houses being built on, on Greenbelt. And by the way, that ex exceeds the figures for the, the whole of the country, the annual figures um, for what at the moment or up to the last few years has been grown have been, sorry, built on, um, on Greenbelt. Okay, when I introduce this... Oops, yeah, I don't know what When I introduce this uh, section, I said, you know, give us a, your views or what you expect. <coughs> My expectation, and I'm looking at uh, our politicians around here on the top tables, I want this study pulled in and canned and just buried. I'm not saying we don't need houses. You know, change is part of life. I'm part of that change when I moved here 25 years ago. But this is not the appropriate site. I question why Aslan has gone into this joint consultation with Brentwood when all the impact is over here. I won't say any more on that because I'm stealing Philip's thunder from his presentation. But that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for our politicians to get this stupid project canned. Yeah. One of the things that people probably don't understand is that we don't just have one battle here, that there is actually two battles. The first battle is to stop this consultation progress. Oh, that's fine. Why don't you shout to that? There you go. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first, the, first, the first thing is to stop the uh, consultation process proceeding any further because we've now got a situation where we're in the middle of a consultation process and uh, effectively, once it's over, the councils of both Basland and Brentwood will be assimilating all the different information, taking months and months and months and maybe even a year or so to look at all the, 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 the objections and come forward with recommendations, etc. But... 
What you have to understand is how we managed to get into this situation in the first place. And going back to the question about uh, what's the fallback position, we actually had a start-up position which was uh, in Basildon Council's um, district plan, local plan, that was proposed last year. Uh, that district plan, district local plan, was in fact to satisfy the housing, supposedly housing need between now and uh, 2030 in the Basildon district. And one of the, one of the um, plans within that local plan was that uh, the Dunton area would be built upon. Now, when we uh, had the consultation, um, the officers of Basildon Council, being the sort of officers that they are, or all officers are, are do tend to be somewhat economic with the truth as to what things are and where we are. And of course the official line was, well nothing has really been decided, it's around this sort of area here where there's green grobbies. And because I didn't necessarily go along with the thought, I dug deeper, I dug much deeper, and found that not only was PADC5, as it is known within the local plan, was going to effectively obliterate Dunton and Dunton Village. There, that plan within Dunton, which, which includes from the Dunton Road all the way down to the railway, from West Main and uh, on the boundary with Brentwood uh, behind the rectory there, that, that that area was going to have 2,300 houses. Now, digging even deeper through a few thousand pages of council documents, including uh, the call for uh, sites via Basildon Council in 2012 for people that would like their site considered for housing, including going through the consultant's Greenbelt strategy that was done for the council, and also the strategic um, planning document to which the basis of uh, this uh, local plan was allegedly built on, there is quite some revealing situations. Some of the most re revealing situations are in the call for sites. Now, um, what I can tell you is the vast majority of people that own substantial pieces of land within the Dunton area said, yes, we would be prepared to sell our land. Or put another way, rather than getting five to ten grand, say, for it being farmland, thank you very much, half a million would be very nice, thank you. And if we just look even further into that, I found that not only were those plots of land, in many cases, actually priced up with their viability, but also, within all these documents, were the number of homes, the types of homes being prepared. Now, if we just, for example, look at this site in Dunton, which is part of PADC5, surrounding Freer Manor here, plot 56 within the Green Belt, which is 100 odd acres, there are plans for 560 homes. Now, they are a mixture of um, apartments, a mixture of flats, a mixture of terraced, a mixture of semis, a mixture of detached, there's, uh, there's, there's private, there's local authority, there is a mixture. But that's it, it's there. It's all there in black and white, or actually black, white and blue, but in the council documents. If you can find it, it is there. So, Basildon Council's officers would, let's just say, at least be economic with the truth in saying there wasn't really any definitive plans at all. Yes, there most certainly was, but they certainly won't go and let on about it. So there are several things about that plan when you look closely at it anyway. With their own calculations of 2,300 people suggested a primary school of eight form entry. Now, there isn't a primary school with eight form entry in Essex. But what it really means was, yes, their sums were right, it would require an eight-form primary school. That would be the number of places that was being calculated to be built. But there was no provision whatsoever for a secondary school, 
no provision at all. There were local shops. And of course, you know, when people talk about the, um, you know, they're going to object to, you know, whether there's going to be shops, whether there's going to be dentists, and all that, they're all very valid points. But the point is to this, it's further expansion of Basildon. You know, I have fought against dry streets since the late 1990s. And now I'm in a situation, virtually now, of conceding we've lost it. We've won it a couple of times, but we're in a stage now where we've gone through all the legal processes and at the moment it's looking grim and it's looking like we're going to get 760 houses built on Dry Street. That grieves me, I haven't fought for it since the late 1990s. And this really gets my goat even more, because what we are seeing now in Basildon is every, <coughs> virtually, every single piece of green piece of land around Basildon is effectively being built upon. That is not why people move to Basildon. They move to Basildon to get out of London, to be surrounded by countryside and green fields, and we had the Green Belt. Now, plots 56, 57, all these plots within Dunton are all green belt. The ones that Brentwood Council are proposing are all green belt. But going back to PADC 5, if PADC 5 had not been proposed in the local plan, then Brentwood Council would not have come up probably with this cunning plan to latch it onto Basildon. It's Basildon that will suffer. It's always been pointed out it's Basildon services that will probably suffer. It's the road section situation that is going to suffer. And Brentwood is going to get rid of its problem in West Horndon, where they're going to be building 1,500 houses. And they're going to end up in Dunton Garden Sober. And as far as Brentwood's concerned, deal done, cunning plan, satisfied, over to you, Basildon, you look after our problem. That is the way that it's being thought of in Brentwood, and we should be opposing it with all our might. And I sincerely hope that when the, uh, when, when the consultation period is finished and it comes to Basildon Council, then the councillors, whoever they are, and it's going to be sometime in the next session of the council, whoever they are, decide to kick it into the long grass and treat Brentwood Council with the content they deserve. That scrubland is probably one of the most rich in, in uh, protected species. It's not just you know worthless land that he can put you know the concrete sprawler over. There are protected species. And when I spoke to the Essex Wildlife Trust, they were just getting on the case a couple of weeks ago. And in the um, this very expensively produced uh, document that you get from attending the drop-ins, good quality paper, four or five colour printing, it. It gives no details whatsoever, apart from the fact four to six thousand homes and gypsy sites. It then gives scant reference to, well, there could be schools, there could be uh, doctor surgery, but don't worry because there's excellent facilities close by. Well, we all know where they are, and we all know from bitter experience that all of those excellent facilities are oversubscribed. And one thing that uh, the lady from Essex Wildlife Trust did say is that if this was to go ahead, and please dear God it doesn't, if it was to go ahead to protect the wildlife, because the council in that document say there will be this corridor linking Thorndon Park with this side of the A127. And she said that is absolutely ridiculous because we would want a wildlife bridge so that, you know animals could cross the A127 safely. I mean, like me, if you've driven down the A127, you see the amount of poor creatures who have been mown down. And, you know, they're talking about this corridor, forgetting about this great chasm called the A127. I mean, you know, it just goes to prove it's a ridiculous idea. Anyway, this section is called the politicians dropping. We're never really sure who's going to drop in, but everyone is welcome. As I repeat, this is a non-political group. We will work with anyone and everyone of all political persuasion. But one thing I will say, we have a yellow card and a red card system, which we will use. This is not a platform for political bandstanding or bashing the opposition. At one of our previous meetings, I issued a yellow card and I made the transgressor aware that they were borderline red card. So, okay, 
to politicians. Just say that on board, please. Okay? Right. Anyone want to kick off? Volunteer? Yep. Uh, you're Mark Ellis from UKIP, yes? Yeah, okay. You can introduce yourself from our voice from last. No, it's the actual one. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Nice and what a, a great opportunity this is. And thank you for inviting me along. And uh, I can't believe the turnout we've got is fantastic. Well, I, I'm Mark Ellis. Um, I'm a local councillor. I'm a county councillor. I'm also a local resident. And I live in Langdon Hills. So I know, that, know this area very well. I'm also a cabinet member on Basildon Council. Um, I'm a member of UKIP. I know, the, know this area very well, and I know the uh, Essex County Council ideas at the moment. I mean, they won't. I spoke to Rodney Bass today, specifically about this, and they, they he cannot make no comments at the moment until this goes to the next stage. That's why Essex County Council have had minimal involvement so far, and they won't have until it moves on. Hopefully, it won't. UKIP's policy is to prioritise brownfield sites, and this is clearly not a brownfield site. This is, this is um, green and pleasant land of England. And if I have anything to do with it, it will be stopped, and I will be voting against it and opposing it on every opportunity. Um, I'd like to say more, I just want to think, but as a Cabinet member, this is basically all we got that came to Cabinet. And I know no more details than you do. I wish I had some more details to tell you. I don't. There really isn't any more details. That's it. It's such a bland document. It's not you know. I could say no more really. Um, that's my theory. It's Greenfields and they should be left as Greenfields. Okay. Yeah, we'll see you yes. Why don't I wrap up at the end? I don't mind. Okay. We'll go to... Uh, yeah. We're going to go to uh, Councillor Stephen Hillier. He's representing Richard Moore, who uh, cannot attend this evening. Um, Stephen may share the same views as uh, Richard, but I don't know. Thank you. I don't like these microphones. I, I find them horrible things. Just before I start, can I just sort of have a show of hands? How many of you live in the Basildon Borough? And how many in Brentwood? Oh, so we, we, we do have some from the other side. I'm glad to see that. Um, right now, in ter terms of um, what, what we have here, and I think Danny, Danny Lovey said this Okay, sorry, I, I didn't want to miss you out, but um, Danny mentioned the, this plan of PADC5, and I think it was Danny who said, without that, Brentwood wouldn't have tried to jump on this same bandwagon, and I think that is true, and other comments have said about the idea that, that uh, Brent would have tried to hook in on this. Because the idea was that if this was a bigger area than just the PADC5, then the infrastructure would have to flow in. And um, I'm not quite sure that, that, that that's the right assessment, and I think that it just puts even more strain on the infrastructure that is there. Uh, and so it is a joint consultation at the moment. There is no doubt of that. Um, and I have to say that at this present moment, the administration on Basildon Council are not taking a position on this except to say that it's out to consultation. And I think, Mark, you, you, you were at the, uh, the Cabinet and, and uh, yeah, you saw what was happening. But the administration at Basildon is not saying we're sitting all in favour of this. We want to see the consultation results. Now, it was mentioned that we've got over 800 responses in already. I think that probably is a larger number than the local plan itself got when, when that went out in consultation a couple of years ago. And that, I think, is an encouraging point of view. But I think what we've got to be careful here is not just the number of responses, but what those responses are saying. And I think Chris mentioned here what the national planning uh, framework says about the purposes of Greenbelt. 
And so the objections are going in there saying that this development goes in the, flies in the face of what the NPPF is saying about the purposes of Green Belt. It carries more weight than simply saying we want the green fields to stay. When we're talking about infrastructure, and let's just talk about the vehicles. 6,000 homes, 12,000 vehicles. Um, so how many traffic movements might that possibly generate in a day? Now, if, for example, the station doesn't happen at Dunton, and people are going to Leyden or West Horndon stations, then we all know the parking at both of those stations is pretty grim. So that isn't just one movement out and one back. That's mum or you know, wife taking husband to the station in the morning, dropping off, going back home, and that's the reverse in the evening. And so if you can start to say that the, that the number of houses are going to generate a figure of traffic movements, and how does that go and perhaps where those traffic movements are going, it carries more weight than simply saying the roads can't take it. Um, now, I know there's been a couple of websites here. I know Philip has got a website up where he's got some stuff, and there's the Facebook site and the blog. There's also a site up there which, which, which we put up that actually says and gives some guidance to how you can object and some thoughts when you are objecting of how you put that together. Now, any of you, and I know Ken had a, you, you had a leaflet there that's got that website on it. Um, it is, you, you have Stephen's leaflet, it's got it on the bottom of there. Um, and I think that what we want to try and do is make sure that as many people object in a stronger fashion as possible. And the fact that you might be saying something that somebody else is saying doesn't invalidate your comments. And we've got over 800 comments now, objections now. Let's have twice as many, three times as many. The more we have, the greater weight it comes when it comes to dealing with the result and looking at those results. And it is going to be a while, and Danny said earlier on that it's going to be a long while looking at those results and assimilating them. But let's have those results in there. Let's try and have them, the, the comments in, in a reasoned, argued way, with as much information as you can get. Um, and I will just, one other point here. Um, Ken, you mentioned about the, the numbers of houses in, in, in Basildon. The first draft, or, or when we first started looking at the local plan, Basildon was being told by all these people who had done the studies that we needed to find 21,500 homes in Basildon. <laughs> The first draft of the local plan we put out, the council put in a figure, I think it was about 8,000, and we were told it was never going to get past the government inspectors. And the best we've come up with at the moment is a figure of about 16,000 houses for Basildon alone. And that is a horrendous number, and we don't know where we can put them. And whilst I agree with the idea that we use brownfield sites first, there simply isn't enough brownfield sites to give us that number of houses. And I will say this to you, that if we're going to have a railway station here, who's going to fund that? Network Rail. Have Network Rail got that money in their pocket at the moment? No. Where are they going to go? To the government. Essex County Council will say we haven't got the money for the roads. Where will they go? To the government. We're looking at hospitals and doctor surgeries. Where are people going to go for that? To the government. And I think that even if we decided we could go ahead, the government bill for this development is going to be so big, I can't see the government even being able to fund it. So I think let's get those objections in there, reason them out if you can, look at the various websites that are about to get some help on that, ask any of us who can help you put those things together and try and get figures for it. Let's get the consultation in there, let's get it there, and let's, as somebody else said, let's make sure that this consultation ditches this project. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Frank Ferguson, and I'm a councillor for Lee Chapel North Ward, which isn't so terribly far away. Uh, I've listened to what's been said. Um, 
First of all, I want to refer to this wonderful, colourful document that we um, were given copies of. It says, concept of Dunton Garden Suburb. A garden suburb to the west of Langdon, creating a place where people want to live, work and relax. Two bullet points later, new gypsy and tra travel pictures. <laughs> they do go together really, really well. I'm sure people will want to live, work and relax next to travel pictures. So that's a good start. Uh, someone said... Uh, about not trusting Basil and Council. Well, um, maybe it needs changing. Uh, someone else mentioned about immigration, uncontrolled immigration being a one of the drivers for the need for housing, and that is so true. Um, what are we going to do about it? As has been said, we don't want to just build on all the green belt around Basel. We don't want Basel to just grow and grow and grow like London has. Um, we are going to have to think carefully about green belt because there isn't enough brown field sites to accommodate what we're supposed to need. But we've got to think about whether we can continue to sustain this increase. Schools. There isn't the infrastructure there, and a plan like this must have infrastructure um, in every aspect of it. It needs doctor's surgeries, it needs schools, both primary and secondary. It needs increased road capacity. As someone has said, there's only two roads into London from here, and both of them are running at pretty high capacity. There's talk about um, uh, putting a third lane on the remaining part of the A13 that isn't already three lane. Well, um, probably by about 2050 that will get done. Um, I suggest we should defer Dunton Garden Suburb until that's been done, and the 127 um, the same way. Um, then perhaps we'll have the infrastructure to support something like this. Not that it should go ahead anyway, but if it's got to, or if it's got to go anywhere around Basildon, um, that sort of number of houses, there's got to be the infrastructure. Um, somebody else mentioned about environmental issues, traffic pollution. Well, that's another big issue. Um, and the more trees we cut down, the less absorption of carbon dioxide there is. Um, and of course, the surface water drainage issue is such an important one. Um, we have seen all over the country the results of uncontrolled building on floodplains. Um, floodplains are there for a purpose. They're a natural feature that are there for a purpose and they should be, you know, okay, you can graze cattle and sheep on them because they can move when the water rises, but you can't move the houses when the water rises. And that's what's been happening. We've seen it. And it's so stupid to... Um, uh, to, to build on floodplains, I think if we build on floodplains, the builders ought to be tasked with permanently insuring the houses. That's something. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then policing. Um, yeah, <laughs> sure, 6,000 houses will generate some more rates, so it will uh, it'll add a little bit to um, Essex County Council's coffers, but I bet not much of that goes into the police force. Um, not much of it will go into the fire service. Um, a, a lot of it will go into administration, which won't help very much. And I don't know how much of it will go into putting the lights back on after midnight. Um, so, there you have it. Um, I think it's a disaster. It's in the wrong place. And I shall be opposing it all the way. Good evening, everybody. I'm George Constantinidis, a parliamentary candidate for Basil and Bellariki, representing Yuki. But I don't like to be the politician, and really sitting behind a barrier here doesn't make me feel comfortable because I'm one of you. I've never been involved in politics before, but 
I'm one of these people that I had enough. Now, first of all, I would like to congratulate these people for putting together a magnificent piece of work because I think comprehensively expresses everybody here and all the issues that need to be addressed have been summarized very nicely and I think they, need, they tick all the boxes. However, how many of you have been involved in different public consultations before? Put your hands up, some of you. Have you, have you ever seen proposals been actually overturned? Yeah. You have, but very rarely though, I would say probably 5 or 10% of the get over time where there is enough resistance. And what I see today here, it is resistance, but you had 800 complaints, but I would say the way they're going to turn it around is 800 divided by 100,000 is probably less than 1% because they will assume that everybody who hasn't complained has agreed with the proposal. That's the way it works. But let me tell you my experience about public consultations. It's a smoke screen. That's my experience, right? Yeah. For something which has already pre-decided, and what this is now is a marketing technique. How they're gonna sell it to you? They're gonna get your responses, then they're gonna tidy up few things, few changes, and then they say, okay, we were taking it into your account, your points, we have taken Professional, that's the word that comes in, professional consultation, and this is what we're going to do. And, but it's also interesting that Councillor Stephen over there said that the government will pay the bills, whether it's for schools, for, for, for trains, for, for GPs, etc., etc. Which government? Has the government got any money? You are paying the bill, right? You're the government, and in fact, in a democracy, if we go back to the basics, you are the masters, right? And what you do? You send in the council or in the parliament your representatives, right? To represent you because you're the masters and they're your servants. And what happens is you have your servants running your life and telling you what you can and you can't do. And it's about time to stop this. And that's why I decided to stand for parliament because. I need to prove to people that direct democracy can work when people get together like this. But never mind, don't account for this. I, I, at the moment, I'm not a politician. I still have to be elected before I can show you how direct representation works. But you have seen here what's going to happen and the proposal, you know, for all the reasons you, you mentioned. Uh, you know, it's not a reasonable project that really complies with common sense. And I always put the common sense factor into everything in my life, including legislation. Something that doesn't pass the common sense stage shouldn't go any further. And this one has gone far too far. But, but, but you know, if, if it was, right? A proper proposal which, you know, that would engage you in a public consultation. Let's here be pragmatic. We understand the need for more housing, okay? And it's going to happen. The population is growing for many reasons that you mentioned in here. We all have no doubts why it's happening. However, houses will be built. But if there was a proposal to say, okay, we have now consider that in Essex for the next 20 or 30 years, so let's have a long-term plan, right? The long-term plans should think about the long-term solutions to the foreseeable problems, which this one basically is a long-term proposal with very short-term thinking, which doesn't take into the account the problems that you, the real people who are going to live here, are going to experience. So, really, if it was a comprehensive proposal, they would come up with about 20, 30 sites in Essex and say these are the brownfield sites, these are the green sites, these are the proposals, we have the GP surgeries, we have the schools, we account for the needs of a new town because this is really is a new town. And then they will put it to you and say, what do you want it built? Yeah? And they'll give you an option. That is a comprehensive proposal, but this is a piece bill. This is the proposal. 
take it or leave it and more or less they're going to force it to you and then next year it's going to be somewhere else this is the proposal take it or leave it etc etc that's that for me is not direct democracy i'm sorry i'm not happy with this i will support you the way and as i say i'm going to be on your side over there thank you very much uh, George, right, well good evening everybody. Um, in case you didn't hear who I am, I'm Stephen Metcalf and I am the Member of Parliament for South Basildon and East Thurrock. Uh, so I'm actually not in my constituency at the moment, um, but of course I am fully aware of the impact that this proposal will have on uh, my constituency and my constituents. Firstly, can I just thank uh, Derek for inviting me along this evening, I, and of course to uh, Paul and all the team for the work that you have done in pulling together this campaign so quickly. Um, I was invited to the two previous meetings that took place, but unfortunately, due to parliamentary commitments, uh, it was impossible for me to be here, but I am pleased to be here uh, this evening to uh, hear your views and then hopefully be able to represent those to those that I can influence in my role as the, the Member of Parliament. Um, this proposal, this consultation, is undoubtedly, I think, the biggest thing that could change the face of Basildon and potentially South Brentwood Borough that we have seen probably in a generation. And it is not something that we must take lightly. We have to communicate the concerns that I have heard come from the room this evening accurately and professionally as possible to those who will make the decision. Now we've heard this evening, you know, why is it we need this housing? What's it all about? Uh, you know, what's driving this? And I do just want to uh, put some flesh on that particular boat. Yes, immigration plays a part in driving up the need for us to have homes. But I do want to put that in context. I believe that on the Basildon housing waiting list, it is only one, of, one in ten people, if that, who are not indigenous British. The majority of growth, and just take, bear with me for a second, when I was born, I had parents and a smattering of grandparents. Now when most children are born, they have parents, most grandparents, and a smattering of grandparents. Great, sorry, great grandparents. But the point is, I used to think in terms of a generation being 22 to 25 years, and we have three generations. We have a whole additional generation, and that is also in the mix, which means we have smaller households, possibly occupying more bedrooms than we, they might necessarily need. We won't go into that one tonight. But all I just want to put into context is what drives that. And so there is a problem, and we have to address it. But I do not think that this proposal is the way we deal with that. I think this is too much, it is a, I know it is, I've spoken to the council, I've met with the council leadership. This is a Brentwood-led plan to move some of their demand away from their conurbations down towards us. Yes, Basildon Council may have opened a chink in the door by putting in some particular planning guidance that they thought they can bolt onto, but this is a Brentwood-led uh, consultation. Now, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to stop this? Right. Well, firstly, I think the thing I want to say is if we turn this political, if we make it about politics with a capital P rather than with a small P, and by that I mean party politics, we will all lose. Because we'll end up fighting, the parties will end up fighting each other and not fighting the proposal. I think the second thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we fight it on planning grounds. We actually keep to what it is that our objections are. And I've heard some fantastic examples uh, this evening. You know, healthcare provision. We know that Basildon Hospital is struggling at times to meet the demands that are placed on it. And you cannot pretend that another potentially 6,000 homes, what, two miles from the site, isn't going to have an impact. We need to understand what that impact would be. With regards to schools, yes, of course we would need schools, and I think we may would probably get a secondary school if this were to proceed, but it is too big a proposal. And someone mentioned uh, the roads network. Yes, of course, the A127, that uh, main route out across South Essex 
isn't even considered to be a strategic route. It's not even considered to be a strategic route, and yet all the building seems to be along, whether it's in South End, Castle Point, Basildon, and then in on into to London. It's ridiculous. And it's not just the impact it would have on our major roads. We've heard a little bit about the impact it would have on some of the smaller roads. Just moving around Basildon would become a nightmare. We would end up with gridlock. But we've got to frame these arguments in reasonable tones that actually people can read, those who will make the decision, and it won't be me. My role, if this were to go one step further, would be later down the road. That isn't to say, and I want to make this absolutely categorically clear, I don't oppose it. It's just I'm not a councillor, and I'm not on the council who will make the next decision about whether or not to proceed with this consultation to the next stage, which would be a more detailed consultation. So I want to just make sure everyone understands that. I am opposing this. Some have said that perhaps my letter left it open, that you know, I would back it at some future point. No, this is too big. My approach to how we deal with our housing numbers is relatively simple. Yes, we need homes. We need to build a few hundred a year towards whatever the figure is, 9,000, 16,000, a few hundred a year on the brownfield sites, do that for five years, and then, in my view, reassess reassess how far we've got, whether all those homes have been taken up, who's using them, what the impact on our borough has been. And if we did that, I think we could combine both. But unfortunately, at the moment, we're not even making progress towards those uh, few hundred. So we have to fight this. We have to fight it through the methods that are available to us, and that is this consultation. As I said, I met with the council last week, and I took the concerns that I have had through my email and letterbox. Uh, I proposed withdrawing the consultation. They'd already extended it by this point, because I am concerned that not enough people knew about this, knew this plan was even being proposed. And I'm still not convinced enough people know that this is on the cards. There are some people who live in blissful isolation, going through life not reading the local paper, not reading the leaflets that we drop through the boxes, and the area that this affects most is actually quite a difficult area to deliver in terms of some of the rural parts. So we have to keep banging on the message and make sure that everyone we interact with, we talk to, know about this and take part in that consultation. <laughs> um, the other thing that came out of that meeting was that I requested um, a meeting between members of this group, the Action Group. Do you actually have, Derek, a, an official title? It's funny, <clears throat> Stephen. As a default, we're called Dunton Garden Suburb Action Group. We don't like it. It doesn't chip off the tongue. So one of the things that I would be putting to the people, give us a name that we can all use. We hate using the word suburb. Sprawl, yes, but not suburb. <laughs> Fine, okay. Well, we've just called you the Action Group. Yeah. Uh, the Dunton Action Group, DAG? Mm, yeah. Not necessarily so. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, uh, I have spoken to the leader of the council uh, and Richard Moore, who is the planning councillor. Uh, we collectively are going to facilitate a meeting between the Action Group, the councillors, and then planners if you want them to be there, officers. Yes. Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely. fine. Um, they will blind you with science, because that's what planners do, and they'll give you all you know, chapter and verse, but we will facil facilitate that, and then you will be able to report back the outcome of that. I think the consultation is going to run the full distance until the 17th, 16th of March. There's not a lot we can do to stop that, but therefore the, the focus has to be on making sure that people take part, that they actually get those views heard. And unique views carry more weight, as uh, Councillor Hillier said, than template views. Once that consultation is completed, the council will then, both councils, because it is a joint consultation, Brentwood and Basildon will assess it. And it's at that point that we will be putting pressure on our local elected representatives. Your job will be done in terms of taking part, but it's then those councillors who have looked, who have the authority to kick this into touch, will look at it. And councillors on both sides of the border need to understand the strength of feeling. Because if it's only the Basildon councillors who feel under pressure, it may well be that Brentwood councillors still decide they want to pursue this. 
And then we will end up with a conflict between two councils, which is not a good place to be. We need to quash this following the consultation. And I believe that this is perfectly possible to be quashed. I think the, the, the arguments against it, are, against it are valid and good, and if they are all individually examined in the cool light of day, I truly believe this proposal will disappear. But we mustn't take that for granted. We must not take that for granted, and we mustn't take our foot off the pedal. John Barron is the Member of Parliament for the, the west of Basildon, above the 127. Uh, so part of this site is in his constituency. Eric Pickles is the Member of Parliament for the east of, or southeast of the Brentwood constituency, where the other part is. Um, I don't actually have any of it in mind, but that doesn't mean it doesn't impact me, which is why I'm as equally interested in it as the other two are. Um, keep the correspondence coming. Please copy me into anything that you feel I should see as you put, take part in this consultation. Um, and as I said, communication is going to be absolutely key to doing this. We've got to communicate as politicians with our electorates. You as residents have to communicate with your neighbours and all of us have to communicate with the council to make sure they know what we are thinking. We will then hopefully be able to do our part and see this plan off. I think I will leave it there. Uh, be assured, I want this to stop. I want to represent your views as best as possible. There may be some steps along the way, and we will take each one of those steps and fight them as necessary. But collectively, let's hope and pray that when this is looked at following the consultation, that everyone sees light, sees sense, and puts it where it belongs, smack bang, in the bin. I put down to full council yesterday, Essex County Council. So far, Essex County Council have not shown their hand in this whole saga. And um, there are some copies, and Phil was kind enough to record. He came all the way to County Hall to record my supplementary question and the leader's response. But the one key point the leader gave in his written response, which I have copies here. And he quotes, and this is Councillor David Finch, the leader of Essex County Council. However, I can assure the councillor that the County Council will only support a plan that makes appropriate provision for infrastructure, including schools and transport. And as everyone <laughs> said tonight, glossy magazine, trendy name, and there's nothing in it. It's just bad will get stung with a problem. And we might need to ingrain them lines and kill it off. And the real villain in the piece is the leader of Brentwood Council. And if anyone's, I hate to sound political, but the Liberals aren't really an issue in Basel, and so it wouldn't be really political. Um, but my, Mick McGough will probably know about them in Brentwood. Um, they put a leaflet in one side of the street saying no to the chip shop, on the other side of the road they put another leaflet out saying yes to the chip shop. And where all their councillors are in Pilgrim's Hatch, and have only got a majority of one seat on the council, they've cobbled together coalition. They thought, well, where do we stick all our housing provision? Mm, oh, that bit of Tory bit that pokes on the Basildon. And because of the duty of, to cooperate, we can draw Basildon in on this. Now, on the 10th of December, every single Brentwood Borough Councillor was given a vote on this. No Basildon Borough Councillor, apart from the Cabinet, has had a say on the uh, consultation stage. So I've put tabled a motion, because I'm also a Borough Councillor for the Nethermain world, uh, just to give councillors a straight vote. And let's see the majority of acts. Now there's one thing you can do as a member of the public. Um, Mike Andrews was there at last fall council, so he gives some advice. You've got until Monday to put in written questions, and there's only a brief window, and I gather there, there isn't any, there may be one or two questions, but that's about it. And it's a half an hour slot to ask written questions of Basildon Borough councillors and start forcing them out. This is what you've got to do. You've got some of us here now. We've got one, two, three, four. four. Beg your pardon, Steve. Five. five. So you've got five out of 42 here. Well, let's badger the lot. Let's get them all on the record. Hold them to a camp. And this is how we bring this plan down. All the villain in the piece needs, Mr Aspinall, is a one seat loss, and he's lost the council. So if you know anybody in Brentwood, I'm not going to tell them to vote for a particular party, 
But just look at the results of that board. Who came second? If their councillor supports building on Danton Fields in Brentwood, tell them to vote for party second and get rid of the villain in the place, Mr Aspinall, and let's have a sensible council leader. They're not interested in these party politics, but someone who's not going to say, well, do this particular end of um, Brentwood in because there's less political come back to me and so what if it hurts Basildon. Let's get somebody sensible in place because at the end of the day, uh, I, can, is it, oh, I, thought I did see a couple of Farrock councillors in the audience, um, but why is it Farrock's not been dragged into this, console, this whole f debacle? They shared a largest boulder with this whole plan and yet Farrock's not been dragged into this. Farrock's kept their hands completely clean of these plans. Farrock's protecting their part of Dunton. So poor old Basildon has been stung by duty of cooperation, which we're obliged to do, aren't we, Stephen? Yeah. It's almost like saying out of one of these wartime films, isn't it? The Gestapo knock. You've got no option but to say yes to this duty of cooperation. So I've hopefully, hopefully I've given everybody a few chestnuts. So if you know nobody in Brentwood, tell them to tactically vote Mr Aspinall out of power. Whichever colour you have to do, do it to get rid of him. And hopefully they'll have a sensible council leader. Two, badger your Basil and Borough councillors. As I say, we've got five out of 42. Let's get this badger them. Four councils on the 19th of February. Uh, try and get your written questions in. I've tabled a motion and I gave a councillor, Byron Taylor, leader of the Labour group, who's also a Langdon Hills resident. He's tabled a question, which will be first read, about the integrity of this consultation. So I thought I'd give it a bit of balance, Mr Chairman. Thank you. So do come along to Full Council, 19th of February, 7.30pm. And if you want a copy of the written question, do come along and see me. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Dear Derek, thank you for your kind invitation to join you this Wednesday, but unfortunately, <clears throat> parliamentary engagements make this difficult for me. Although an MP's power when it comes to development issues is somewhat limited, given that this is a council issue, you should be aware that I do have reservations about this proposal, uh, proposed development and have made these uh, known to the council. I believe we need clear evidence of money on the table when it comes to the extra investment required across the full spectrum of our infrastructure particularly when it comes to our hospital, primary care services, road, rail links and schools. In addition, I attach particular importance to the Council's consultation because such developments should have the support of local community who have to live with the consequences of any such development. I will continue to keep my constituents informed of the progress with regards to uh, my inquiries. Would you please pass on my, job, uh, my apologies for absence at the meeting, but feel free to convey this message as you see fit. Okay, we've also got a letter from uh, Linda Orthel Hodge, the UKIP uh, member in person, um, Langton Hills Ward. She says, Derek, thank you kindly for the invitation. Unfortunately, I have a prior engagement on Wednesday, but I understand that George Constantinidis of UKIP will be in attendance and Councillor Mark Ellis of UKIP. I understand that there is a further meeting planned for Thursday, the 5th of March, at James Hornsby, but that's been put back until the 12th of uh, March. Um, again, unfortunately, I'm at cabinet that evening, or perhaps you will. <coughs> you. Excuse me. Water, please. Um, so perhaps you will be able to attend. In the meantime, I'm in touch with my residents keeping up with progress made by the campaign group. I will also be submitting a motion for consideration of full council on the 19th of February, asking for a resolution to kick it into the long grass. And then she gets put political, which I'm not going to read. Because as I will say, we're a non-political group. We will work with anyone and everyone. And then we have a, a, an email from Byron Taylor, the Labour person. It says, Dear Mr Gibbs, many thanks to your email. Unfortunately, it is my wife's birthday that day. Well, we know where he's got to be, don't we, guys? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can I ask Labour's parliamentary candidate for Basil and Bitter be Gavin Callan and to attend? Is Gavin here? No, okay, all right, he's probably got other in engagements. Um, I've copied him on this e e email. Okay, let's... Okay. Hi, I think she's a Conservative councillor? Yes. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, I won't be available for the meeting on the 11th of February, as I'm currently, I won't go into her personal details of her ill health, but she's not well and not feeling great. 
I have no intention of supporting the proposed development of this site for numerous reasons. The infrastructure, or lack of it, increased burden on local GPs and hospital services, demand for school places at all age groups, just to mention a few. The water supply and sewage removal would also be a major issue. The old Langdon school site is still not finished uh, and the first phase are already experiencing problems with excess water not draining properly. Common theme, that isn't it? Um, let me know, I never knew that the old Langdon school was on a flood uh, plane, but perhaps the buildings made, uh, made one of its, of its own. Um, she goes on about the March date, if she can make it, but please be assured that I won't be signing up for this proposal. The last one is from uh, Andrew Schrader. He's Conservative uh, Billericay. Billericay. Yep. And he said, Dear Dr. Gibbs, thank you for taking the trouble to contact me. Unfortunately, as a member of the planning committee, I'm required to act in a quasi-judicial manner when considering planning applications. I would not wish to comment publicly on an application that may potentially come before the committee in the future. I would not wish to say anything that could lead me open to accusations that I had predetermined an application, as that could mean I would have to recuse myself and would prevent me from voting on it. I feel sure you would understand my predicament and thank you in advance for your forbearance. Okay, taking what uh, Councillor Andrew Schrader said as, uh, as gospel, that you know, as a member, he, you know, it would be wrong for him to comment. As uh, Kerry Smith called this chap here, public enemy number one, has he not really played the rules by council protocols or is there any rules that would actually rule him out of uh, voting? Would perhaps our councillors could advise looking in, into that? I don't know. I'm a member of the Basildon Planning Committee. This is a consultation. This is not a planning application. And I believe that if you speak about it in the right fashion, you can advise residents and you can take hearings from residents without necessarily expressing a view as to, to whether you would want to see it or not. But it's not an application yet. It is a consultation. You've heard what I've said. I'm, I'm, I'm quite in the clear over it, as far as I can see. So the question uh, still remains. We don't think that uh, uh, public enemy number one, Barry Aspinall, has uh, overstepped the mark in any way. Oh, it's, it's not just him, it's the whole the cause. Yeah. You know, there's a whole group of them who told one message to get elected and then came out with another message after. Sure, that's politics. No, no, but no, no um, <laughs> sorry, I'm very cynical right, right. through previous right. experience. Uh, no, no, Chris, it is. This, this chap, he's actually dismissed the area, he's been very scathing about it, and he talks about you know, Shenfield being a green and pleasant uh, land that they want to keep there. I think he's actually uh, kind of prejudicing the uh, consultation, but I'm not a, a solicitor or a legal person. I've got a freedom of information request. They uncovered, I think, your colleague over there who knows more about Buzzard than else, probably did some of this. But there were some secret reports on transport and other infrastructure that weren't in the public domain that would go to be against the project but have not been made public. And it may be the case here or in Brentwood, but it's worth, you know, a few letters, a few emails or an FOI request, you may uncover something because they've got to give you that information. It may be, it may be worth you, your time doing that. You won't, may not get it in time. For the deadline, because they've got a train that was it 20 uh, odd days, um, they've got a reply. But nevertheless, it puts them on inquiry, and you've got that for the next stage if there's anything there. It's worthwhile. Thank you. Um, this is the point where I'm going to hand over to just to show we are reaching out into other groups who have experienced um, these problems. Um, I, I'm not having a reply back from Ed Cohen of the uh, Clunchman Village. Committee, but uh, I'm going to ask you in a minute, uh, Ed, if you want to say a few words, and I'm going to have Mike Taylor. Taylor? Yes? Andrew. Um, Andrew. Sorry, I'm troubled names. <clears throat> Mike Andrews, beg your pardon. 
would you like to tell us of your experiences over in uh, Bidiriki? They're further down the line, and it's a group that we are um, working with. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'll come up in front if that's all right. Yeah, sure thing. Um, now, I'm not certain how many friends I'm going to make on one side of the table here, but um, we'll see. <coughs> um, I'm chairman of the Bidiriki Action Group, and I'm also a spokesperson for the South East Essex Action Group Alliance. Nice catchy title. I'll tell you what it means a bit later. Uh, a couple of things we mentioned. Police, some mentioned police stations. Have you have read that the Bidiriki Police Station is closing some stage? That's good that all these people come in. Um, disingenuous uh, planning officers. In Billericay, we, we've got three PADCs, 13, 14 and 15. And the 14 is the one that's quite close to me. There, there are two roads in Billericay, Outward Farm Road, Outward Common Road, and they enclose a field, two fields. And when we saw the original documents from Basel and Council, there was no real detail on what it was. Um, when we spoke to the planning officer, they said, well, we, we, we can't tell you that it, that exactly where it is because we haven't decided what's going to be there, but there's only two roads, there's only two fields, there's only two places it can be. And when we questioned further, what it actually amounted to was that they couldn't actually, they're, they're claiming they couldn't tell us because they didn't know whether 90% of it would be concreted over or 98%. But that was enough to say, well, we can't tell you it's that, in that field. So disingenuousness is uh, an interesting term. Uh, I, I'm really interested tonight with the, uh, the, the councillors. Um, Perhaps in Billericay we don't have as much competition for councillors because when we asked our councillors um, if, we could, if they could get involved, one of our councillors told us, uh, once you elect us, we're not here to represent you, we're here to run the council. <laughs> so so I mean, I'm really pleased to see some, some councillors here tonight. What, I'm sorry you didn't get your fence approved last night. <laughs> and I'm really pleased to see an MP that actually will voice a comment. Um, I'll just do a couple of things that well, well, I've got loads of notes here and uh, a lot of things have been said. Um, the, the process, we've heard that, uh, that the information wasn't really communicated to the people. In fact, that the history of your group is exactly the same as ours was, exactly a year ago. It starts off with a few local residents find out that something's happening. Uh, and then you form into a group, uh, and then you start to have meetings. Now, I, I don't want to worry the people of this place, but the first meeting we had, uh, we didn't actually announce it, just word of mouth, but 80 people turned up in this, this hall behind a pub in Billericay. Unfortunately, the pub has now gone out of business, and it's going to be turned into flats. Now, I might presume this place is safe, but, you know, no, no. Um, the, the, um, the, the, but, but, uh, as, as Kerry said, I, I did ask a question at the, uh, the council meeting before Christmas, and one of the, the question I asked was, bearing in mind how badly the information flows have been managed for the Basildon 2031 consultation, which I will come back to in a minute, um, were they going to take, what were they going to do in future consultations? And the response I got back was that they, they were considering that they were seeing what lessons could be learned. Well, they clearly have, because when it came to your consultation, even less of you knew it was going to happen. So I, you know, they, they stick to their words. Um, someone mentioned the template letter. Certainly when we tried this last year, we were told by the planning people that if, if you have a standard letter, you all sign it with your individual names and addresses, that only counts as one objection. So if 50 of you sign that letter, 100 of you sign that letter, that only counts as one. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly recommend that you don't go down the template group, although what we haven't been told is how different the letters have to be. So it could well be you just mix the paragraphs up, that might count. Uh, maybe a few spelling mistakes, I don't know. But, um, yeah, okay. Um, I, I'd like to, like to go back a bit. When we were faced with this last year, it was then the Basildon 2031 consultation. Now, um, some of you will probably be aware of that. That was the the, the pre predecessor of this isn't quite the right thing. That was a the uh, development of a local plan, and that was the uh, development of a plan for 16,000 new homes across the borough. And as someone's already said, 16,000 new homes, 32,000 new cars, 50, 60,000 new people. Well, bear in mind it's not just that because, as we've already heard, Chelmsford have discovered. Um, that the farthest place you can get from Chelmsford is Rumwell. So they're going to put 50, 560 homes in Rumwell, 
Uh, of course, they're actually going to be serviced by Whitford, which is part of Basildon. So, so, so that's great for Chelmsford. And of course, now Brentwood are trying to do the same thing. They, they found that the farthest you can get from Brentwood is just up the road here. Uh, but you already know about that. Um, that 16,000 new homes, 2,800 of them were going to be in Whitford, mostly on Greenbelt. 2,500 in Billericay, 92% on Greenbelt. Uh, and, and the rest, of course, south of the, the A127. But of course, that's 16,000. That's bigger than Billericay is now. And Basildon want to do it field by field. So they want to build a town that's bigger than Billericay now, but they want to do it by hopping from field to field. Okay, over in Bicester, they're planning to put a new town in there of 13,000 homes, I believe. And there it is going to be a new town. It's going to be a town with infrastructure, with roads, with hospitals. Here in Basildon, we're just, just hopping a field as you go. So one of the things that the Billericay Action Group has done is we've not got into this battle of don't build it in Billericay, don't build it somewhere else. We actually believe the fundamental problem here is the number, that's 16,000, the objective, the assessed need. We, we don't believe it's justified. We produced a white paper, 30 odd page uh, detailed document, I wouldn't believe that I understand most of, but it actually goes into proving why that 16,000 figure is unjustified. A couple of things in there, what we, we, we identify is that the natural growth for this area over the period of time that these homes would, would be built is around about 8,000, 8,000 to 400, it, it varies how you get, get it. So, just bear in mind that 16,000 is twice what would be required by the natural growth of the borough. And also, jobs-wise, bear in mind that 16,000 is 50,000 people, say 30 odd thousand adults, in the plan I think 8,000 new jobs were proposed, I think that's the figure. It's something about them, they may well be, but bear in mind, 30 odd thousand new people, 8,000 new jobs. So, why are our council looking for this 16,000? Well, it depends who you talk to. At one of the cabinet meetings I went to a little while ago, um, everyone on the conservative side of the cabinet said, not us, Gov, it's the government. Phil Turner said it was the government. I mean, there were several other people there, but the basic view was, don't blame us, it's the government. Of course, then we wrote to our MP, and our MP wrote back and said, absolutely not, not the government. No, the government don't say any figures, nothing to do with us. We asked the, uh, the Basildon planning officers, they had the answer. They said, we use the same consultants as everybody else. So there's the justification for, for Basildon's numbers. They use the same consultants as everyone else down the line. It doesn't actually strike me as being a very good argument. But, uh, but the reality, of course, is that what happens next? After we've had the consultation and we've, we've all had our say, and as some people said, whether our say is valuable or not, um, it actually goes to a planning inspector. And the reality is, and I, I do have a lot of sympathy for the, the council people, is that the fear of the councils is not just ours, it's across the country. The fear is that when they get to the planning inspector, the planning inspector will turn down their plan and impose something else. But then you have to ask the question, who sets the level for the planning inspector? Surely that's back to central government. So. I'm a little bit concerned that, that the answers we get, uh, there's a degree of disingenuousness about all of the answers we get. Um, I'm not certain what the right answer is, but certainly my, uh, the, it, it, it seems a lot better that somewhere in the centre of this is government policy. It may well be that you could claim that you didn't actually set the number, but if you set the planning inspector at the algorithm they're going to follow, that's just as close to setting the number as I can see. And there's also, um, there, there was a planning inspector was taken to uh, Castle Point. Senior planning inspector, he was in the Echo uh, a few months ago, and this planning inspector said, well actually you don't need to build on Greenbelt. Absolutely no reason why you should build on Greenbelt until it's a local decision to build on Greenbelt. You make the decision you want to build on it. Because if you don't, you just say I can't meet those numbers. That was the view of a, a, a local planning inspector. And then you start to think, well, if, if we're being pushed to take 16,000 in, in our borough, and half of those at least are on Greenbelt, you almost think that, well, perhaps they've actually made up their mind already. Uh, and and I, that view was reinforced in my mind today because someone showed me uh, a response that Basildon Council had made to a uh, Brentwood consultation back in 2013. It was to do with their plans to build a number of homes down by the 128. I must admit, I wasn't 
fully aware of this until today, but uh, quite a few thousand homes down by the 128. And the view from Basildon to Brentwood was, you're not building enough homes and you're not finding enough green belt to build on. That doesn't strike me as the comments of someone that is open to protecting their green belt. But, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll misread the article. Um, okay, so, so what happens when you have put your consultation responses in? Okay, we're a year down the line. After our uh, exercise last year, there were, there were 2,500 people responded. Um, half of those came from Billericay, so Billericay represents about 20% of the population of the borough, but half of the responses came from Billericay, and, and BAG, the Billericay Entry Group, we actually delivered about 90% of those to the council. And I think it comes to about 10,000 individual comments. I think that's the number that's uh, being talked about at the moment. And as a result of those comments, we were told uh, there's going to be a delay to the plan now. So, so lots of comments to be considered need to take time to, to consider them. And we thought, well, that, that's really good news. But then is it? So I mentioned earlier that we got this white paper that uh, analyzes or, or that demonstrates that the 16,000 is unjustified. Well, that's not going to be included because it's not going to be included in the, uh, in the information base because it was submitted out of time. Now, bear in mind that the council have just announced that they're going to delay their plan for a year, but because we didn't get our white paper in, in the, the period, the few weeks that were available for the consultation, our white paper's not going to be considered. Now, actually, we're getting it in through the back door because it, we've objected to Dunton and we've included the white paper. Uh, we'll see whether uh, Basildon Council wants to not include it as part of the... Uh, yeah. the, the other thing, of course, is that um, back when the original consultation was announced, if you go back through your copies of the Echo, you'll see uh, Councillor Moore commenting there. And one of the things he said on several occasions was, uh, the residents who are commenting can't influence the choice of sites, so that's the PADCs, they can only influence the number of homes that will be built on each site. And that hasn't been rescinded. That comment hasn't been rescinded. So I've got to say, what the hell was the point of us even commenting? Because now, of course, we're also being told that the residents and residents groups aren't to be included in the next year's uh, evaluation of those comments. So what will actually happen is, in it, back at the end, back end of this year, probably October time, when the new plan comes out, two years will have elapsed since we last saw the plan. At that time, we had a couple of weeks to comment on it. In the meantime, the council, the planning department, all their consultants would have been beavering away to produce a new draft plan. And guess what happens next time? We'll get another couple of weeks to comment on it, and then it goes to the planning inspector. So in all honesty, I have to say that I don't think that that is an open way of doing business. Uh, we keep getting told maybe it's the law, the law is responsible for a lot of things. Uh, but I've got to tell you, I'm not optimistic that those efforts have actually been worth anything. And I've got to say as well, bear in mind that the plan that we commented on last time, Basildon Council, with its consultants and its planning department, had already been working on for two years. We got a few weeks to comment on it. We produce a white paper that takes a little bit longer than a couple of weeks to produce, and we're told it's not going to be included. Actually, I'm certain that's over optimistic about that. Okay. To, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, just a couple of things. I'm on the last bit now. Okay. I think what people have said it, the geography of this area is, is rather unique. We're a peninsula. If you go from Thurrock down to, to Shoebury, we're a peninsula. Thames on one side, Channel at the far end, and the Blackwater and the Crouch at the top. We've already heard it. Most of our Traffic flow is east-west, I've got 130, but basically it's all east-west. Every other council is doing exactly the same as ours. Every one of the, what those councils do impacts on us. Every new commuter who lives in Lee is one less seat by the time the train gets to Langdon. And the same goes on our line. Bear in mind as well, someone's already said it about this area, this part of Essex, we're under 20% of the area of Essex, we have 70% of the population. We are already one of the most densely populated areas in the country. So what has happened is, uh, there are a number of other groups around the county, uh, around this area, and what we've done is we've now formed the, this Action Group Alliance. Uh, we've already got Rady, Holbridge, Dorsey, Jotman's Farm, 
Uh, we have a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks' time. We've already had three or four other groups, including Dunton, uh, who look like they're joining us. And what the aim that we're going to try to do is to bring together a voice from all of the different action groups around the uh, around this part of the world. It includes Malden as well, so they're not quite in, but they're close. And there's three main areas that we're going to address on that. One is the, and we're not political, and we're not going to be addressing individual concerns. But there are three key things. One is the numbers. We believe that our numbers are wrong. Every other action group you go to will tell you that there is no justification for numbers. They're being foisted upon them by central government, and the councils are scared to put in what they know their residents would like because they're scared of what, count, what government will do. The impact of that, of course, is that all these homes we've built go on the green belt. Uh, every other council, every other community is in exactly the same position. Greenbelt was there for a reason. It's probably more important today than it was in 1949 yeah. uh, when the Planning Act came in. And the other thing that we're going to be talking about in Arga is localism. You've heard of the Localism Act 2011. If you go through it, um, see how many times you find the word resident. It's not, not very good. It talks about lots of other local important people, but residents <coughs> don't seem to count too much. So the other thing that the Action Group Alliance has been looking at is the lip service most of our councils pay to, to localism and their residents. Uh, and hopefully you'll be hearing a bit more about the Action Group Alliance uh, over the next few weeks. Okay, thank you very much. It's the uh, Dunton Community Association that was formed in 1977. It's there to look after the interests of uh, the Dunton residents. There's about 250 in all um, that uh, are there. Um, we, when the consultation paper came out, we held a meeting uh, and a uh, democratic vote what they want to do about it. And it was unanimous to say we'd like the uh, committee to act in the interests of the community and do everything we possibly could to uh, prevent the, uh, the uh, site um, urban sprawl being developed. Um, we said that we can't be in a position of saying this is uh, watching out for our interests because, uh, what do they say, not, not on my, my backyard. So we said the principle we're looking at is protect the Dunton village, which has been here for a thousand years, one thing. Second thing is uh, the, the green belt as a whole. Uh, it's a duty that I think we all have to say protect the, uh, the green belt we're putting in place by our, our forefathers for the benefit of our future. And for us to be in a position at this area, where it's the boundaries of the green belt, to be, have an incursion of this nature, uh, it, it's, it's wrong. And if we say that, uh, as far as uh, we're concerned, we're looking at the interests, not just of, of the green belt here, but if something happens here, it's going to be the next stage elsewhere around, around the green belt. And we've, uh, again, everybody's mentioned these, these points. We've put in a case, an argued case, for every, everything we can think of to put forward that should be there. But one of the things is not mentioned is the, the, the windfall gained by the landowners, the properties that are around here. Now, if, you, if we mentioned before, Danny said that the land was 10,000 up to 500,000. I think it's probably a million odd, just for the sale of the land. That doesn't count the value for the developers to do it. And we're talking about Basel as, as the guys that are saying this is the motivation coming from it. The motivation is where the money is. The motivation where the developers travel around the country and talk to landowners, and the landowner says he's happy having a farm, and he's, he wants to keep it. And he said, there is an acre of land, it's now a million as opposed to 10,000. Anybody here, what would you say? Yeah. You say, screw you, I'm going to move. Yeah? Now, whose right is that? Is it the right of the, uh, of the society to have the green belt, or the right of the land, landowner? Now, my feeling is, it's the right of society. And if we give up the green belt, then that value is back to society. So the value from the 10,000 to the million, put it as a tax, back into the council, or back into the central government. If you did that, then the green belt would be looked at differently. And so instead of this windfall gain coming through, it would be not making money there, let's go to brownfield sites. And until we start to control that gain that's being made by the landowners and by the, by the developers who keep on pushing this round and round and round, it will never be addressed. So that's not maybe a local issue, it's maybe a central issue that needs to be, be put at. And no, whether it's George Osborne or whoever it's going to be in the next, uh, uh, next parliament, unless that position is addressed, it's going to carry on and there's going to be incursions into the green belt continuously. And if you say, well, that's not right, it's the, it's the advantage of the land, landowner, well, then, you know, put it in the same uh, breath as, as the, the bankers or anybody else. It's a windfall gain that's gained from a position where society is giving up the green belt to a person absolutely on the land at the time. And it's the developer and the landowner that's pushing the, pushing the councils to say, this is a good option, isn't it? There's the plan, there's the housing, what do you want to do? So the likes of whoever your planning committee is, tick the box, that's done, it's off my desk, there it is. You know, simplistic, solve the problem. So uh, there it is, wrap it up, good night. Okay, uh, we're over...
our allocated time. Um, what is it? Our next steps. I will ask you all to spread the word. We've got people here from outside uh, the immediate uh, impacted area, but please bear in mind the implications of this. The reason that we're forming uh, alliances, if you want to use that word, with other action groups. The reason we're talking to Ed Cohen from Dunton Village and for Mike from Billericay, and we will be talking to other people. As someone said about the A127, you know, a car down at uh, South End going into London, it's very impactors. So it's a county-wide problem. So please spread the word. Um, I'm very pleased, my next point was attempting to get a meeting with uh, Stephen Metcalf and the officers. It's very important that we have a full-up understanding, in layman's terms preferably, and we will put this back on our, uh, our Facebook page and tell you, we want to know all the proposed developments, those are in the early stages of thinking, so we've got a very wide understanding of how our communities are going to be Im impacted. Another request, as I said earlier, can someone please come up with a nice, easy to remember name and do not use the word suburb. We have looked, we're working, we've done some village people, sorry, um, uh, they're putting someone forward to work with us on possibly designing car stickers, a constant theme, posters and so on. It looks as like though it's going to be very uh, expensive. <clears throat> it's in the uh, very... Uh, uh, it actually, although it's a lot of money outlay, it actually only works out to between 50 and 70 people per sticker. Okay, I've just been... My wife doesn't have a habit of correcting me. Yes, it is a big outlay, but it works out about 50 or 70 people per car sticker. So. Everyone's driving around, you park them in the, the station, uh, you park them in wherever you go, and it'll get the message, and it'll be a constant theme. As our politicians have said, you know, chase them, keep them up to date. They'll be coming around the houses for the, the elections. You know, keep pursuing them, write to them, tell them what you want, and you know, just keep them involved. They can work with us, I hope they do. Um, although the cut-off date is the 16th of March, as it's already been said, because of the upcoming elections, you know, we won't get decisions until after that. All that remains is for me to thank everybody for attending. Stephen, Stephen, George, Frank, Mark, and anyway, everybody else. Thanks for your good input and advice tonight. Thanks to everybody for attending here. A special thank you for the people Mark Fisher and his staff at uh, Freeham Manor, thank you very much for putting on such wonderful facilities. <laughs> Last, um, I mean, we should have had, um, as Bells and Council had the dropping meetings, bouncers on the doors, we should have uh, someone on the door with a bucket. If you want to contribute to our uh, fighting fund, um, there is a, a bucket here. As you know, we, as I said, there will be some expenses coming up. And I think we're all in this for a long ride. Thank you for attending. Thank you.